Deborah Gallant. I am the executive director of e for all in Berkshire County. I know some people might not know what that is. So e for all entrepreneurship for all. We run fantastic programs to help people get their businesses started up. Our program mostly is about an intensive business accelerator that gets you started. But what happens is you learn so much and then there's more stuff you need to know. And so I was been a business coach for almost 20 years and I created this deep dive program because I think there's other stuff you need to know. So every month we do a program that gets you a little bit deeper in. Um, we've done them and they're all recorded. We, so you can access them even if you miss them. We've done them on hiring your first employee, which if you've ever done that can be really hard. We've had them on how to get more traffic to your search and to your website with uh, out paying money. We've had one on e-commerce and today I'm delighted to introduce our, our speaker. So let me just bring this up and see if there's anything else I need to tell you about e for all Hold on one sec, if you present. Okay, I'm your facilitator, Deborah Gallant. Our presenter today is Michelle Miller for the Center for Women in Enterprise. And I'll let Michelle introduce herself in just a moment. Today, our topic is should I get certified as a woman or minority owned business? As I mentioned, E4All, wait, Mary, there's your picture. Oh, Erin, there's your picture too. Um, E4All has helped over 500 businesses get started and we are a program that wants to help everyone. So if you don't know about it, you should. These are our founding sponsors in Berkshire County. Without them, we would not be here today. So thank you to all of them. Here's the format today. We are gonna take what we're doing for the first hour or however long uh, Michelle's presentation goes. Might be a little more, might be a little less. I'm gonna be um, staying here and curating it and making sure she answers all the hard questions. We encourage you to use the chat and tell me if you have other questions that I am not thinking of. But then we're gonna stop the recording and we are gonna let you ask your own questions, talk about your own situation, ask her more things that, you don't have to worry about it being taped and uh, people watching it six months later and going, I didn't want my question to be taped. That part we don't record. Um, I will tell you that in our deep dives, we get so down in the weeds. Sometimes we hardly get to the questions because we're so busy in the regular conversation. But I'm going to actually stop sharing because you don't really want to hear from me. You really want to hear from Michelle. I will ask you if you don't mind putting in the chat box while she gets herself set up. Um, who you are, what your business is, and if you have a special interest about coming today, like my brother got government contracts, or I heard this was good, or I heard this is hard, or anything you want to share with us um, as Michelle gets started. So Michelle, if you want to start your screen share and do your intro, it's all yours. Not hearing you. How long have we been in quarantine? And I don't know how to unmute myself yet. What a thing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well, thank you all for your patience. <laughs> and thank you for sticking some of those, those comments in the chat. Uh, Y'all can see the PowerPoint. Yeah. We're good. Excellent. Okay. I noticed that while I'm screen sharing, I can't see everyone's faces. So if, you know, if there's any challenge hearing or anything, just, just give me a holler or stick it in the chat. I can, I've got the chat open in another window. So, all right, thank you all so much for being here this evening. I am with the Center for Women in Enterprise and I'm really jazzed to be here with E4ALL. I, our programs complement each other really well and it's part of why it's such a wonderful time to be an entrepreneur is that there's so much out there to help you. So we'll chat about certification options today but I'll just introduce you to what CWE is uh, to start. The Center for Women in Enterprise, or CWE, is a nonprofit economic empowerment organization. About half of our funding comes from the U.S. Small Business Administration, and what that means for you are the programs that we operate. You've probably heard of SCORE and the Small Business Development Centers. You might have heard of the Women's Business Center Program and or VBOC. These are nationwide programs that the SBA funds and offers to help make sure that folks are starting and growing successful businesses, that they have the right foundation. Uh, and we all play in the same sandbox, all the SBA family score, SBDC, CW, you'll hear me mention them a few times this presentation, because uh, we all have our own angle, we all have our own things that we can do, 
and we're all largely free. <laughs> so at the Center for Women in Enterprise, we operate five women's business centers and we operate the Veterans Business Outreach Center of New England. So basically what that means is from birth to selling your business, uh, we provide supports to help figure out how to do that, growth strategies, what exiting might look like. Um, you can find classes and information on our website. And one of the services that we offer is a WeBank certification. Um, and I will talk a little bit about we, what WeBank certification means in a moment, but what more interests this group, I think, and is better for looking at the chat, what might be a little bit better for folks is just knowing what certification is. There are so many different ways to get certified. It's not the right fit for everybody. And then there are lots of different contracts that are that are out there um, that apply to folks. So I will chat about what certification is, but uh, at the end of the slide, you'll get the copies of the slides. My contact information is on there. If you take nothing else away from today, it's that you don't have to memorize anything that I say today. <laughs> I'm delighted that you'll have the recording, but a lot of information that I'll share is general. And then depending on where you wanna go from here, there might be partner organizations that are in the best position to help you take those next steps. I'll talk a little bit about who they are. You might feel like you're swimming in alphabet soup. I'm gonna do my best to avoid that. Please ask questions and please feel free to, to stay in touch after this, right? We're here, we're free. There's no need to memorize everything. I just wanna make sure that you have kind of an intro to what uh, the world of contracting is. Uh, okay, so while I go, I'm going to take a look at this. some cool businesses y'all are running. Very nice. Here's how I'd love to orient the conversation. I'm watching the chat box, so please do throw in if you've got questions. But I'd like to start with just kind of an orientation to the world of supplier diversity. If anyone has started to look into contracting before or certifications before, you probably start to see all of the alphabet soup. And then you start to see all these words like vendor, supplier, you know, diversity. Da, da, da. Um, and so I'd like to just start with an intro to what that is. And here's my beautiful picture <laughs> of what the world of supplier diversity is. Well, and here's the thing, it's, it's a complicated picture because it's a complicated world. It is a complicated world, it, but, but it boils down to a couple of key things, vendors and suppliers. The vendors are you guys, people that sell things. It doesn't matter if we're talking a service or a product the vendors are the small businesses that have something to sell. The suppliers are entities that wanna buy that. So we're especially talking about not, you know, for, for I see someone has a, a party service. I imagine that a lot of your, your current clients are families, are people. How that might look in the supplier diversity world is now we're talking about contracting with an entity like CVS to provide those sorts of services to their, uh, um, to their staff, something along those lines. It's, so, pretty, it's pretty straightforward if you have a, a kind of a business service or product that is bought by big organizations, government entities already. So I'll just throw one out there. If you have a landscaping business, you could be knocking on people's doors and flyering their houses and selling to them. But then you could also get the contract for cutting the grass at the federal courthouse. But that's a that's what we're talking about is, is that the federal government or whoever awards those contracts has in their bylaws or some ruling that they need to give a certain percentage of their work to entities owned by women or minority owned businesses or, as you say, veteran and uh, LGBTQ and disabled. And if they don't do that, they get in trouble. Like they have to do that. It's a set aside, correct? For some cases, yeah. And we'll chat about that in a moment. So I'm really glad that you talked about why folks might want to care about those diverse owned certifications. Um, but yeah, there are lots of different ways to celebrate the diversity, you know, the, but the orientation that I would love to just, you know, when, when you hear me say vendors for the rest of the presentation, I'm talking largely about all of you, the small business owners. And when I'm talking about supply, or excuse me, um, when I'm talking about purchasers, <laughs> um, I'm talking about folks that are going to buy from you. So you can see that there are different categories and what kind of all this falls down into are two big buckets. You've got the public sector and you've got the private sector. These are people that want to buy things. 
the public sector breaks down into the federal level stuff, the state level stuff, and the city and local level stuff. And then private sector things usually are corporations. And you know something really interesting before I before I move on, I loved what you said, Deborah, about if you've got something that that a larger entity might want to purchase. Something that fascinates me about these conversations is how vast the world of supplier diversity. I mean, people buy everything, right? I've got a client who is a barber. She cuts hair. She got a contract with the Department of Defense in New Hampshire, and she goes on to Pease Air Force Base once a quarter, and she cuts everybody's hair. <laughs> That's a contract. Um, other contracts include, I loved your example, Deborah, of landscaping opportunities, cleaning companies. If, if you've got something to sell, chances are there's an appetite for an organization to buy it. Office supplies is another great example, right? Um, what gets real cute when we start talking about certifications <laughs> is that a lot of these different levels have different types of certifications. So that's the other level here. If you want to do business with the federal government, there is a woman-owned small business certification that you might want to pursue. They don't have a minority equivalent at the time, um, but they do have an, an 8A program. So that's where we start swimming in alphabet soup. But that's kind of the orientation, right? We're talking about organizations that might want to buy from you. And so that's the first question when people wonder what is certification and why do I care? Goes back to Deborah's point. When there are opportunities to bid on jobs, whether it's buying office supplies or cleaning offices or cutting people's hair, <laughs> building cribs. I've got another client who is a woodworker and he builds cribs, got another contract with the Department of Defense to give cribs to all the Air Force bases in, in a couple of countries. Um, they, they're going to look anytime you can put yourself in the purchaser's shoes. If you want to hire a landscaping company for your house, chances are you're going to look at a couple of different quotes and you're going to consider a number of factors. One of the factors you might consider is whether or not the owner of that business meets with a certain goal that you have, a certain historically disadvantaged population, for example, that you might want to look at. Um, so when we're talking about this, as I mentioned, so so that's that the primary benefit of certification. <laughs> and sorry, I need to, uh, I'm just going to mute the chat for one moment because I realize that I am reading and talking at the same time and I'm probably taking you all <laughs> over the map. So Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got that muted. I promise I'll open it back up in a minute. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm not talking in circles with you here. Uh, certification guarantees the ownership structure of your business. You and I might know that your business is fully owned by a woman. However, for someone purchasing at that level, especially if there's a particular quota that they're trying to meet, meet like what Deborah was saying, they're going to want a little bit more information. And so a certification provides you with uh, validity, a sense that you are indeed who you say you are, that your ownership is what you say it is. And then to an extent, it can help you in the contracting arena. So if you're up against a whole bunch of other cleaning companies that want to clean that brand new Bank of America office building that just got built down the street from you, you want to make sure that you can take advantage of your diverse ownership is as part of that process, because that will be one of the factors that they consider. Note how I said one of the factors. <laughs> I'm gonna get into some common disclaimers in a minute. Um, but before I move on from this slide, I just kind of want to orient. When we're talking about people who are gonna buy things from you all, the small business owners, we're usually talking about people who fall either in the public sector bucket, federal level people, state level people, or municipal level people, or we're talking about the private sector. Um, so usually when folks are talking to me about certification, my first question is, well, what do you want to use it for? If it's something like marketing, um, and you're not necessarily looking to get into the bid process for a federal level or private sector contract, well, I would love to shift the conversation with you to your marketing strategy. Let's talk about how to best incorporate the fact that you are owned by a person of color, that you are owned by someone who identifies as having a disability on and on, rather than going through the process of getting certified. If you want to leg up on some contracts, yeah, buddy, let's talk certification. The first step to being able to do that is to identify where you want to do business. So that's where it's helpful to know 
Are you so quick? one of the questions I had in the in the signups was why wouldn't I? And we can talk about that, but we're only on slide six of 27 and I bet you're gonna answer some of these questions. There's some fantastic questions in the chat, which I'm glad you muted. We're gonna spend the whole last half hour answering your questions. So I'm gonna let Michelle take her ball and run with it because I think this is such meaty stuff. Here's my ball, I'm gonna run with it. And, and, and it is meaty. And I know that we wanna kind of just do an intro here. So I'm glad to do a deeper dive into questions after. If I start to get too in the weeds, Deborah, I trust you'll, you'll call me out on, I will get higher up. But yeah, why wouldn't I get certified is a great question. And we'll start with why you would get certified. Um, and I wanna start with some disclaimers. I don't know if folks here have heard about certification or contracting opportunities before, but some, some uh, common myths that I hear, uh, I always like to dispel early. First of all, getting certified does not mean you're gonna go get a bunch of business, right? It's also not a way to fix a challenge with your business. A lot of times folks will come, they wanna get certified because things aren't going so well in their business. Their sales are stagnating. So I should get certified, which means that I can bid on contract. It's not necessarily that much of a you know, that, that's not necessarily the answer. We might be talking about a challenge with your business model that we should answer so that you can actually take advantage of contracting. Um, certification is also not required for the whole contract bidding process. With a few exceptions, there are some programs um, to, the, to the point of set-asides um, that, that, that are exclusive to diverse owned vendors, people who have gotten a certification in one or more areas. And then it can get a little funky when you're on the government or on the, the corporate sector side. Those guys don't always publish their certification or their contracting opportunities. So you might need a contract. But by and large, certification is not required to bid on contracts. You can find a lot of them, especially on the public sector side and bid on them anyway. So please don't feel like you have to pursue certification. Definitely not a guarantee that you'll win a contract. It is not a way to fix a business that is having a problem. Um, and it takes time. I'll go over in, in, in a few slides, I'll go over some of the general paperwork that you need to gather. But between the paperwork that you need to submit, the interview process that you typically need to go through to verify that you are who you say you are, and then the process of really researching and putting in effective bids on some of those proposals takes a lot of time. So this is definitely not something for folks who are pre-launch, or really even most folks who are in their first year of operations. This is, you got things going really well, your business is chugging along and you wanna explore a new market. Um, and that new market might include corporations or government entities. That's really when we wanna start chatting about getting certified. If you're not really interested in that arena, then there's really no point in getting certified. There's cost and money, or excuse me, cost and time associated with most forms of certification. So the easiest answer to why not get certified is why spend the time and money if you don't actually need it, if it's not advancing you toward a goal of getting some of those contracting opportunities, well, probably not worth your time. Okay. Um, You know what I just realized? We started to chat about um, why some of these purchasers might look at your certification. Folks on the public sector side, they typically have federally mandated purchasing requirements. Um, in Massachusetts last year, there was this big kerfuffle with SBA Massachusetts because they needed to meet uh, their quota for purchasing, uh, for, for contracting with folks that go out and plow throughout the state that plow the roads in the winter, they could not find enough certified um, women or minority owned businesses to meet their quota. So yeah, they, they, that, so usually on that side, it is a quota system that has been federally mandated of all of the dollars that you have for X, Y, and Z parts of your budget. You must send, spend a certain percentage with women-owned businesses, with minority-owned businesses, with disability-owned businesses. On the private sector side, it's usually part of their corporate social responsibility initiative. The government usually doesn't come in and tell CVS what percentage of its business it has to do with 
any particular type of ownership of business. But CVS has stakeholders and supplier diversity initiatives, which mean that it wants to, as a corporation, its board has set internal goals for doing a certain percentage of their business with those categories. All right, so what we've got here on the screen is just another way to think about what the primary benefits of getting certified are. Top front of center is this contracting thing, which can lead to business growth if you get those contracts, if you're successful in that arena. Also can be really great for connections. Uh, when you are certified, whether we're talking the public sector side, the private sector side, most of those certifying agencies will put on what are commonly called matchmaker events, where they will pull together a bunch of people that wanna buy stuff with a bunch of people that sell stuff and make connections so that you can network, you can see a list of people that, that do business where you wanna do it. And then lastly, what comes along with a lot of certifications is this idea of credentialing, this idea of, yeah, I'm a legit business that can handle a good amount of work. Um, okay, so this is effectively what I just said. <laughs> but it's helpful to have it, then you could reconnect there. So, so you know, it's, it's about connections. Oftentimes, there are specific training events that are targeted at certified owned businesses. A lot of it depends on who certifies you, right? Which brings us back to that first slide at that whole little world of supplier diversity. For example, if you're looking at um, Massachusetts level grants, remember you got the public sector bucket and the private sector bucket. On the public sector bucket, we're talking about federal, state, or municipal. The state of Massachusetts has what it's called its Office of Supplier Diversity. Those guys have trainings, they have uh, matchmaker events. If you're one of those folks that wants to bid on a plowing opportunity in the, co in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, those are the guys you want to go talk to. Michelle, let me just um, ask a clarifying question. So yeah. I know Erin is on here with her birthday party business. Yeah. That's not something that it normally would be bought by a corporation. Maybe it's a, a benefit that some company decides to give to their families for, I don't know, something or other. But it feels like this is a lot of work for something that's a non-traditional category when she's still gonna have to do all the hard work of opening all of those doors. And maybe the time is better spent uh, just doing good marketing and, and getting out there. And she can certainly say she's a minority, you know, woman-owned business. And, and some people might want to do business with her because of that. But it doesn't seem like that makes sense. But if you sell something that is bought by big corporations or governments, even barbering or a crib assembly, if you can figure out that there might be a purchase opportunity where there's a set aside for minority and women owned business, this might be worth it for you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And so I brought us back to this slide because that that I, I don't think I sell it, said it as elegantly as you, but exactly. Certification is not right for everybody. And, and to your, your original question, Deborah, or one of the questions about why would I not get certified? <laughs> that's a if, if you're not looking at contracting opportunities, chances are certification isn't the right fit for you of any type, woman owned, minority owned, any anything else. That's really one of the, what, what certification is primarily used for. Um, but looking at it from a marketing standpoint is great. That said, I am constantly surprised by the things that people get awarded contracts to do. <laughs> so I would not necessarily, you know, make the assumption that any of your business ideas are not worth getting certified. What I'd encourage you to do instead is first of all, focus on your business model, get it up and running, get it really running well, right? Because as I mentioned before, that's a, that's a prereq for all of this. Um, and then start thinking about what a growth strategy could look like. Is there a possibility on the corporate or government level side to make a purchase? And you might not know, right? For example, the birthday party service, I, not sure, you know, although there are some corporations that run educational programs. There are some corporations that focus on people with different levels of ability and or have clients um, uh, who have who have 
um, right. She could out. subcontract to an organization that puts on events for disabled children and, and come in and run those parties. I mean, there might be something. It's not that you would necessarily um, count it out before it starts, but there's some that are more obvious than others. The, the other thing, and I don't know if you have this because I haven't seen your slides before, but the people I know whose businesses survive or, or thrive because of government contracts spend a lot of time writing RFPs and details and then accounting for what they did afterwards. Selling your services or your products to a big entity um, through a contract and a bidding process is way different than any other sales you've ever done. And it's it's way far from a sure thing because especially there are other people who've been doing it much longer and know all the games and know how to get those contracts and know what to do in terms of the paperwork and who to talk to and what date you need to be in by where. And it's it's pretty complicated. It's not a sure thing for anyone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I, I, I love. And just while we're on that, I'll come back to kind of my little disclaimer slide because yeah, that's that's, very true. It is not a guarantee. There's a lot of work. And that's not meant to dissuade anyone, but but you should go in with eyes wide open and make sure you have really clear goals as, as far as what's there. And if you're not really sure what RFPs might be out there, I'll talk a little bit about it later in the presentation. I'll talk about the authorities in some of these different areas of contracting uh, that can listen to your business idea and let you know whether or what type of certification might be worth it for you. They can help you to look at RFPs and get a sense for whether or not there's actually a demand for what you're, what you're offering as part of your decision-making process. All right, so what makes you eligible? So on this slide, you'll see it's pretty woman-centric, but it is where we're chatting about multiple kinds of certification options. So substitute that word woman or woman for person with whatever type of, dis of, of um, historically disadvantaged status that you're looking at. So requirements for the vast majority of certifications. You have to be fully formed and operational. What does that mean? You have to have some sort of a business entity registered somewhere. You know, it could be an LLC, it could be a corporation, it could be a sole proprietorship, but you have to have a business registered. And it has to be operational, meaning you don't want to just pop over to town hall tomorrow, submit a DBA, and then try to go get certified next week. You want to make sure that you actually have a working business model, some sales that you're making um, of whatever it is that you're selling. They also want to know that you're at least 51% owned, operated, and controlled by a woman, if we're talking about a woman-owned uh, diverse business, or by a uh, someone who identifies as a member of the LGBTQ community, someone who identifies as a member of the BIPOC community. The key words are 51% owned, operated, and controlled for any of these. Um, and that gets to be a little bit of legalese. And, and those of you who are pursuing certification, um, well, <laughs> even if you're not pursuing certification, it comes with my strongest recommendation to chat with an attorney and an accountant early on just to make sure you're set up right. But how that particularly uh, pertains to the world of certification is they can make sure in those cases where you've got multiple owners and not everybody identifies as a member of the historically disadvantaged group that you're talking about, um, the attorney can make sure that your entity is structured to meet those metrics. And that's going to be one of the first things that any of these certifiers are going to look at. We run into this a lot of times with um, on the woman-owned side with husband and wife teams, right? They might set it up and declare the wife to be the 51% owner, but as part of the certification process, the teams are going to come in. They're going to look at the respective salaries of the husband and wife. They're going to look at what their functionality is within the organization, who makes what decisions, and they'll look at their organizing documents um, to make sure that you are, that she does indeed have at least 51% owned, operated, and controlled. Um, the only, ex so, so you'll, you'll see on bullet three there, it's not really about how big your business is or what type of business it is in order to qualify for certification, but there is a little sidebar for nonprofit organizations. And I saw at least one person mention in the chat earlier that they are a 
uh, nonprofit organization. There is a certifying body that, that gets into the world of nonprofits, but most of them do not because the ownership structure is different, right? There, there isn't really an owner of a nonprofit corporation in the same way that there are for-profit corporations. The other thing is that the owner with at least 51% uh, has to have US citizenship or resident alien status. And so that's just something for everybody to know going into it. Uh, if you're trying to figure out who to make the 51% owner, or you're trying to figure out uh, whether or not it matters uh, what, your, what your citizenship status is, um, this is, this is your answer. For the majority of certifiers, the person doesn't have to be all owners, but the person with at least 51% or more control has to be a, either a US citizen or a US resident alien. How are we doing on questions? There, there's a few hanging in there, but I want you to go through the presentation before we do the opening up. And I, I'm pretty sure that we'll have a quite a lively conversation once we open it up. Excellent, I love it. Okay, um, I'm gonna throw in another acronym while we're talking about alphabet soup. WeBank has nothing to do with banking. It just sounds like it. <laughs> it stands for Women's Business Enterprise National Council. If you'll recall, one of the first slides, we talked about the public sector and the private sector bucket. There are different certifying agencies on all of those levels. So sometimes that means that organizations that wanna do business with the feds with their municipality and with Walgreens are gonna have several different certifications. And that's okay. You can get as many certifications as you want. The good news is that a lot of the paperwork required is the same, um, but it is, um, it just, it's just good to know that you're one cert, no one certification is gonna cover all of your bases there. Um, so if you find that you are interested in the private, sector side. You're probably going to hear the term WeBank thrown around, and that is a national third-party certifier. What do I mean by that? That means that you can't just declare yourself to be woman-owned. Someone is going to come in and interview you and look at all of your paperwork and make sure that you are, in fact, woman-owned. Interesting when you look at the public sector equivalent of this. Up until July, either June or July of this year, you could just declare yourself to be owned by a woman, if, if that's the case, and submit all your paperwork and you're good to go. Unfortunately, we did see a bunch of people taking advantage of that situation. And so in June or July, I think it was July, they shifted it on the public sector side. And so now they're going to come in and verify that you are who you say you are as well. Point is, should you be looking at public sector certification and you are looking to get certified as a woman-owned business, you're probably looking at what's called a WeBank certification. CWE houses that certification for New England, but it's not a New England specific thing. You get certified in Boston, that certification will be recognized with corporations that are also part of the um, WeBank network in California or Kansas or Texas, nationwide thing. Um, so you guys administer the WeBank program if we're in this area and, and if we apply and we get it, we can put on all our materials that we're WeBank certified and then apply for um, contracts under that certification. That on right? the private sector side, exactly. Exactly. It's, WeBank lives in the private sector bucket. And the, what, what does it cost me to apply? I will show you the breakdown of chart of costs, I think, very shortly. Okay. I'll show you. Of course question. you have that. Sorry. <laughs> I think so. And if I don't, I apologize and I'll be sure to send it with the slides. But it goes by revenue of the business. Anyone up to, I think, a million dollars in annual revenues pays something like $350 a year. Okay. All the public sector stuff is free. And never, ever, ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Unfortunately, that's another really common uh, way that, that folks ga game the system. Um, there, there are costs for many private sector contracts. So there's WeBank, and if you're looking on the minority side, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, I will show you that in another slide. Those guys have fees. But 
if you're looking for anything on the federal, state, or municipal level, and anyone is trying to charge you to get registered anywhere, to get support with any application, you should call us. <laughs> we should report them. That's probably a scam. Okay, um, back to this. So a little bit about private sector certifications. On the public sector side, as, uh, we, as we mentioned, there are federally mandated set-asides. So if we're talking about the federal government, the state level government, or your local city or town, there's a certain percentage of their business that they just have to do um, with, with dis diverse vendors. On the public sector side, it's all voluntary. So you're gonna see a lot of the, the certifiers on the public sector side, or on the private sector side, certifying not only you all as the small business owners, but also corporations that have committed to doing a certain percentage of their business with you. So an example of some of the, the corporations that are certified via WeBank are here. There are several of them are also certified via the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council. It's just good for you. To, yeah. I'm sure, I'm make sure I understand this. So Brandeis University, which happens to be my alma mater, has, has committed to honoring the WeBank certification uh, for their vendors, is that what you're saying? Correct, yep, they pay a fee every year to be a um, corporate member of WeBank, which includes meeting certain supplier diversity goals. It includes going to uh, these matchmaker events. And yeah. when they set out their annual report, they say, look how smart we are. We have diversity and we're using these suppliers. So um, this is, just gives you an idea of the vast reach of these companies and how many thousands of vendors they must each have. Um, and there's opportunities there. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the vast bit is really interesting, right? So for example, when you're looking at schools, um, I, I can't speak to Brandeis specifically, but in general, a lot of schools look at this list when they're trying to consider who to buy food from. There are a lot of certified women-owned businesses that mass produce prepackaged food. Um, every now and then when people, and that's why a, a little while ago, Deborah and I were talking about what may or may not be worth getting certified for. This is part, it, it can be so surprising, right? So sometimes you'll look at the list and you'll see Biogen. Well, I'm, I don't play in that arena. What can I do? Well, Biogen buys office supplies. Biogen needs folks to, to do cleaning for them. Biogen needs marketers. They hire so event planners. They, they do everything, right? Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, the, the, the world of diversity can be really interesting when it, uh, supplier diversity does, can be really interesting with the number of things that people buy. Um, okay, how do you get certified? Now this is specific to WeBank, but it is very similar to the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, which is the equivalent for the BIPOC community. It is a certifier for businesses run by people of color that, um, and it certifies corporations that have made a commitment to do a certain percentage of business to them too. I will, as I promised, have the link to them because I know that's a long uh, name as well. How it goes, there's an online application. I have the WeBank application there. Anyone who's interested, I can send you the link for the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, but it's really similar. Online application, upload all the documents that they want to see. You give them their money, you sign it, you submit it. They're going to reach out to you and they're going to say, okay, Here's what else we need. We need to schedule a site visit. Right now, those are all virtual, but at some point they'll go back to being in person. We're gonna wanna interview your ownership. We're gonna wanna look at all of your paperwork and we're gonna wanna make sure that, that you are who you say you are. Um, alphabet soup, remember I promised you RPO on number two. Here'll be a fun one. Should you find yourself on Jeopardy someday? RPO means regional processing organization. You don't need to know that. I just have it there because it's easier to fit on a slide. That is the team of whoever is certifying you. <laughs> so once you upload all your stuff, in this case to WeBank, one of our team members is going to reach out to you, help make sure that your application is has been submitted in full, arrange that site visit for you, chat with that. Same thing is going to happen on the Greater New England Minority Supplier. All right, Michelle, I'm going to ask a hard question now. Okay. The, the PPP program ended up being out of reach for a lot of E4L entrepreneurs because they just didn't have the record keeping to, to support it. Is that the same barrier here? What kind of documents are you asking for? So that is a really 
challenging thing. And, and, and for a lot of the clients that come to us through the Women's Business Center side, right? So the, the, the WeBank thing is one arm of what we do, but the core of what we do at CWE is what's called the Women's Business Center. And the vast majority of our clients had the same issue. We had very few numbers that, that were approved for PVP and EIDL. And then the Massachusetts State Grants, if you saw that, that grant opportunity that, that was out over the last couple of months, we had lots of clients that didn't have it either because they just didn't have the record keeping. So unfortunately, yeah, that can be a barrier um, to, to, to folks. It is also a lesson and something that, I, that E for All, CWE, SCORE, SPDC, what we can all do is help you get all that infrastructure in place. Um, I think you'll find that it's helpful not only for grant and loan applications, but it's helpful just to have a better handle on your business. If you actually know what your cash inflows and outflows are and you've got a strategy, I think you'll find you sleep a lot better at night and you earn more money. <laughs> so um, yeah, so do do reach out to us. They, these these are the the core documents that you're that you're gonna need. I'll follow this link and share a new uh, screen here. Um, oh well, oh, we've got 20 minutes. Maybe I'll I'll I can show the, the links there I, I can show you all the stuff if we if we have time, but it's also it's on that website. Um, but yeah, they're gonna look for all of the stuff that you had to submit in order to become a business. So sole props typically have less that they that they submit. Corporations and LLCs typically have more, but they're gonna look at all of that. They're gonna wanna see the resumes of everyone that's on your ownership team. Um, they're gonna wanna know how you're registered to operate. So, okay, what is governance information? I don't have a board of directors. <laughs> well, if you're a corporation applying for certification, then you will. And that's exactly what we mean. Uh, for LLCs, usually we're talking about things like your um, operating agreement, things like that. Okay. Yep. The good news is that, that as, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, most of this is top heavy. Your first year of trying to get certified, whether it's WeBank or with the on the federal side or the GNEME, SDC, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, it's going to be hardest your first year because they don't know you and they don't have any of that paperwork. The next year, they will have already done an interview. They will have been talking to you throughout the year. You just need to update things. Just. But... You know, this is probably a good time to remind folks that several slides ago, we talked about at what point it makes sense to start thinking about certification. And I had said, you really shouldn't be thinking about certification until you've got all your gears grinding. You've got a really solid business model up and running. This is part of it. It takes a while to gather all that stuff. Um, and in some cases, you might not have set up all of those things. So this is a great opportunity that if certification somewhere down the line might be something that you want to look at, reach out to, to the E4ALL team, reach out to CWE, SCORE, SBDC. Um, let's make sure that you've got a solid footing in your business, that your business model is singing. Um, and then I think you'll find that this process is a lot less challenging if and when you get there. All right, okay. I will, if I have time, I'll go back to that sort of that, that link there goes in detail exactly what documents they're looking for. The same thing exists on the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, and the same thing exists on the certification arms of the federal, state, and local levels. I've got websites for all that coming up. <laughs> Here's the, the, the fee question, and I did not lie to you. I'm delighted. Every business with fewer than $1 million dollars in annual revenues is paying $350 as an annual application fee. And then as you can see, it goes up from there. As a sidebar, if you head to cweonline.org slash certification, when you get these slides, those should all be hyperlinked so that you can just click and go. Um, but we've got an overview there that kind of reiterates what I said, what I've said so far about what certification is, why you care, and what those major buckets are but it's got it all listed there as well that talks about what the you know different certifying agencies are and that's all hyperlinked as well, so. Okay. You wanna get certified as well-known. A couple ways you can do it, right? As I mentioned before, do you wanna do business on the private sector side or do you wanna do business on the public sector side? You wanna do business on the public sector side if we're talking federal level, here is where you need to go. It's offered through SBA, uh, it's free to apply, remember, capital, bold, and underlined, anything that has to do with the government should be free. 
And if you're not sure about anything that someone's trying to charge you for, please call us. <laughs> um, we would be glad to help you to, to sort through space. It's so unfortunate how people, do, oh, anyway. Um, so most of the documents that they're gonna ask you for are the same. Most of the eligibility requirements are the same. Um, I've got a hyperlink there that you can see more about what the federal contracting thing looks like for women, what all that is. Um, it is now a third party certification. So those of you who might know folks who are already certified as WOSB over on the, the government sector side, they might say, oh, well, you don't have to have a, a site visit. Well, you didn't used to, <laughs> but now you do, so. So Michelle, is this process similar to yours in terms of an online application and then they're gonna interview you and, and do a site visit or at least in, in a post COVID world, they'll do a site visit. And, and at that point, all you've got, if you get approved, is, is some kind of thing that you can put on your contracts that say you're approved. It's not like there's business associated with it. All it is, is it's getting you to the starting line so you can apply for these grants, uh, these uh, contracts. It gives you a potential leg up. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you brought it because this is something that I like to say early and often to folks. Getting certified is not a guarantee of business. <laughs> it can help. If much like, I, th I think the example I gave near the, the beginning of the presentation was if you're trying to hire a landscaper for your own house, right? You're gonna look at, at a lot of different things among different vendors, their price, what their reviews are like, um, if you like the owner, right? And, and for, some, for some independent purchases, it might also include whether or not they identify as a member of a historically disadvantaged population, right? On the organizational side, if we're talking about the feds or corporations, their process is very similar. So it is a potential leg up. If, if their CVS wants to have somebody to support all their office supplies, they're gonna ask people to bid on that, to say what they can provide at what schedule and for what cost. So the how person, do they find out about this stuff? Where do you, where would you send someone who was coming to the CWE for counseling to find out what kind of government contracts are out there? How would they find out that they're looking for a barber in New Hampshire? Hold the mic. I will get to that. Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's a really great question, and it depends on what side of the house you want to. But, but I'll just I'll just quick finish my thought before I before I move okay. on, which is cool. just that. Um, oh gosh, and of course I lost it. Oh right. So so someone's got something that they want to buy, whether it is a hair cutter that they want to have come in, they want to have someone come in and and do their marketing, host their party. They're going to put out what's called a request for proposals. People are gonna see that. I'll talk about where to find that in a moment. Uh, the people who are collecting all those applications are gonna look at a bunch of different things. They're gonna wanna know how long you've been in business. They're gonna wanna know uh, what your track record's like. They wanna know if you can actually execute successfully on that contract in order to do it. Um, and if they get to the point where they've got two applications that are both pretty good, chances are they'll give preference to the one that is certified um, as, a historically disadvantaged business, right? And how heavily they weight that will depend on how much pressure they're against for their for their set asides. But it's just one factor in the consideration. So that's yet another reason why at the beginning I mentioned you, know, you, you need to have a singing business model. Things need to work really, really, really well within your business um, because it's not gonna be the certification alone that gets you a contract. You're gonna have to do a lot of homework on the other side. Okay, federal level state level, um, then we're talking about, <laughs> see all the acronyms, uh, then we're talking about the Massachusetts Office of Supplier Diversity, same documents, same eligibility requirements. There is one extra step here in the process. They offer a two hour workshop, you've got to attend it in order to get certified. Now that's the woman owned side, they do also offer what they call a DBE certification that covers folks that identify as members of the BIPOC community. Um, but the process is the same. And if you follow that link here, um, you will see what that looks like for all the different levels of, of diversity that the state of Massachusetts recognizes. All right. So what are all those different ways? Um, you'll see this hopefully better on your, when you get the presentation, um, because they're just, the world of, of, of supplier diversity gets, gets full of acronyms and it gets big fast. So we put together this little chart, where you wanna do business and what level or levels of diversity your business represents. That tells you where you should go. If you're a small business, you wanna do business with the state government, great. 
head over to the small business procurement program, which is what we've got here, or the Office of Supplier Diversity that I had before. Talking about the feds, great. Let's go talk to SBA. Um, if you are, and that's that's general small business, right? So that we're not talking about women or BIPOC community or anything else yet. You're a woman-owned business. Great. You want to do business with corps? Cool. Go through WeBank. You want to do business with the state government? Depends on what state you're in or what states you want to serve. But here's the Office of Supplier Diversity for Massachusetts for those of you. Uh, the SBA is Women-Owned Small Business Program if you're looking on the federal government's side. Okay. And here's where I mentioned earlier someone was, I think, curious about nonprofit certifications. Supplier Diversity Office is going to handle that as well um, for women-owned nonprofits. Okay. So I won't go through all of these in detail, but you can see these and you'll get the slides depending on what level or levels of certification you want to get, right? Whatever level or levels of sort of, of uh, diversity you represent and wherever you want to do business, there's a chart of where to go. Several businesses meet multiple categories, right? For example, um, the federal government recognizes an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business, EDWOSB. <sighs> Told you you're going to get real great with the acronyms by the end of this. <laughs> anyway, um, they recognize, so, so anyway, um, you might fit multiple categories and that's fine. Get multiple certifications. I wish there was a better way um, to do that because I realized that for the entrepreneur, that's a lot of work. Um, and the only good news I can offer you is that most of the paperwork is going to be the same. <laughs> so that's, that's a silver lining, but it is still multiple applications and, and things like that, depending on where. So yet another argument for what I said at the beginning, wait until you're up and running. When you're at a point where you can really work on the business versus in the business, you've got people who can handle most of the day-to-day -day operations and you know how all that works. Now you can shift your headspace to really strategize on where and how you might want to grow. If that includes contracting, then great. Now let's tap certifications. Um, okay, I just made a couple of the FAQ ones a little bit bigger here. So you've heard me mention the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, link to their application, link to the Massachusetts state application. If you identify as someone with a disability, here's where you can do that. If you identify as a member of the LGBTQ community, there's a certification there. Um, and on and on. So lots of really great ways. Your challenge is number one, make sure that your business is up and running. If you've got challenges with, as many people do, I did before I started working at CWB, I had a coffee shop for a lot of years and I, I am now the case study for all of the things that I tell people not to do about business. Um, you know, so, so, so get up and running, take advantage of resources like eForAll and CWB and such that can help you to make sure you've got all that footing. Business models up and running, great. Now let's start chatting about certification if that might be the right fit for you. So Deborah, this goes back to your last question about where do I find all this stuff and who can help me? You wanna go on the public, on the, the private sector side? CWE's WeBank team is great. There's also a team on the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council side, which you can see uh, on their website here. The WeBank team offers a free monthly webinar um, that you can link to that. And if you watch it, they also record it so that you can save it and go back to it. And what they offer in that webinar, it, it's kind of WeBank centric because that's what they do, but they offer a really nice introduction to all of the different certifications. Um, so those guys are really great. So watch that webinar. If you have further questions for them, great, reach out. I also love the PTAC. This is the, these are our sibling organizations on the public sector side. Um, folks may be familiar with the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center. If you're not, they're great. Would love to introduce you to them. Um, again, they're a sibling organization to CWE funded by SBA. One of their programs is this Procurement Technical Assistance Center. It is free to use as everything else on the public sector side is. I feel like I can't say that enough because unfortunately they're just some people trying to charge you for stuff they shouldn't. Should you want to explore anything on the public sector side, you can just register to become a client follow that link. And if you happen to be, you know, in a different state or also interested in serving other states, they have affiliates in every state throughout the country. Uh, you register for counseling. It's usually a quick online application. They just make sure that you're, that you meet the prereqs, like you're up and running, right? 
Um, and then they reach out to you and you get a counselor who's your counsel that will walk you through the process, who will help to make sure that you are invited to all those matchmakers that I was talking about, who will make sure that you know how to navigate the procurement opportunities. For example, all of the bidding opportunities at the, at the Massachusetts state level, the federal level, these guys are your guys. They will make sure that you have all of those links. Similarly, on the CWE side with WeBank, when you're certified, they will make sure that you connect with corporations that are also certified and they, they maintain a registry um, of certified businesses and corporations so that you can find each other as well. Um, these other folks all have wonderful uh, support staff that you can reach out to with very similar services. I just start with these guys because they are the, um, uh, the, the most general ones that, that deal with the, the greatest number of certifications. So that's why I have the most level of detail about them. 456. Wow. Okay. We got 34 minutes for questions. I've got my contact there. Um, what do y'all got? Michelle, me? why don't you close your PowerPoint, but keep okay. your screen open. And if you don't mind, can you log in to a, a contracting site so I could see what contracts are available to a small business in Massachusetts? Is that possible? Uh, sort of. Why don't I show you? You need to share your screen again and then. And then yeah, then. I'm just going to pull up where I'm trying to go first. I've got these, I've got these two screens. Working from home is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, All right. You know what I'll do while you look for that? Yeah. Uh, let me ask if you have a question that you want to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to do it the old fashioned way and raise your hand so I can see you and call on you because I want to hear you and let you have an interaction with Michelle. So she's going to show us this and then we're going to go to the questions. Okay. So this is where it can take a little bit of time to show all the different places to find contracts. Because as I mentioned, contracting happens on the federal level, the state level, the municipality level, and on the corporate side. What I'm showing you here, and I'll put this link in the chat, this is from SBA. So we're talking federal contracting, okay? So if you go to sba.gov, and I'll put this hyperlink in the chat, um, you can see all the different ways that you can you know, get certified, different types of programs. They've got some cool online contracting guides, da, da, da. And if you come down here, find contracts. Okay, look at this. The dynamic small business search, the database that government agencies use to find small business contractors for upcoming contracts. And then there's also SAM.gov. So if you register with SAM.gov, you are now in there as a diverse vendors. So business opportunities for contractors are listed at beta.sam.gov. So I don't believe I have a, an active login for this. So I might not be able to show you as much as I want, but the point you would be able to come here, you create a free, everything on the public sector side is free, a free account, and you will see contract opportunities. Let's see how far we can go here without an account. Ah, look at that. Sources sought for notice for dry cleaning services for the Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery, right? So here's one, and it will tell you now, who would have thought a dry cleaner in Houston uh, would get, be a set aside, but why not? You know, um, yeah, so, so, and it will tell you what the, it's going to have all this government, you know, language. I don't know why they don't put sentences together the way that you and I do, but there's that. And if you want more information, you can see this is a public document, so you can open that. Oh, and it's not going to let me share it, is it? Let's see. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. We get the idea. Okay. Can, can you um, show us a Massachusetts one? So the Massachusetts one comes. I know. To the, I know. There's some people on the call who are not from Massachusetts, but the vast majority are. So I'm gonna go there. The Massachusetts uh, system, similar to what we were just talking about, is called Combis. So you register as a vendor here, and you have to get trained, you know, um, but then this is the site where you would come, you'd have to create an account, and then you can look for open bids, and you can see these. 
asphalt crack sealing construction services <laughs> uh, is the first one that I see. Police virtual training. That's another one, you know, where, when we talk about surprise things for contracting, I know of someone who um, supports folks with, with different levels of ability, specifically kiddos with autism. And she got a contract to provide a training for a local police department on how best to de-escalate situations where there might be someone with a different level of ability there, um, especially if that level of ability isn't necessarily visible. So they, 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 she got a contract to teach them how to identify that and then also how to de-escalate the situation. So lots of cool things that you might find contracts for. There's uh, 633 contracts in there right now. That's amazing. Indeed, indeed, yep. So I showed you federal, uh, that state, City level gets interesting because there are just so many cities um, and towns in Massachusetts and they all have their own <laughs> service because why not? Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll put those links in the chat, uh, but the, the two primary places that you can find those contracts once you're there are SAM.gov and the uh, GSA, the General Services Administration. How about the, the WE Bank? Can you show us that one? I can't because that is part of the what you what you pay for. So Got unfortunately it. that one is not public like the public sector side stuff. Um, we are gonna be doing this training in Spanish next Monday. Michelle, you have a translator gonna work with you, is that right? I do, I have the director of our Rhode Island office who is my counterpart and speaks fluent Spanish, so. So yes, thank you for asking that question, Adriana. Okay, if you wanna stop screen sharing, Michelle, we're I at 5.02. And Casey, I think we can stop the recording.